Okay, so um, this is the third lecture. Um, so as we have been talking about sort of multi-agent, many-player systems, and trying to see how they uh, react and control with each other. And um, so we've been studying the Nash equilibria in games <clears throat> with a large number of players when the games are of so-called mean field type, which means the dynamics and cost depend on the player's own state and control and on those of the other players only through their empirical measures, right? That's what we've been studying. And lectures one and two, we covered static mean field games. And this lecture will fo focus on stochastic differential mean field games. But I'm going to try to, of course, it's going to involve stochastic differential equations, right? But I'm going to try to do it in a way that you see the big picture. And I'm not going to be putting down all the little, um, you know, conditions of all the, on all the coefficients and things like that. But just what is the new issues that arise? What is the form of the definition and, and sort of a high level uh, view of that? Okay. So, um, okay. And, and as we know, that the general principle that we've been seeing is that in an N player game, you have a, you know, co collection of Nash equilibria, that's NN. And you want to sort of show that they converge in a suitable sense to the equilibria of some other system or some, some solutions to something else, which is often called the mean field game or mean field equilibria. And in the context of stochastic differential games, this goes back you know, uh, more than a decade to Lazry and Leons and simultaneously Huang, Malhame, and Keynes, who really, what they did originally was to actually just define the limiting system. They didn't really study any convergence issues, but they just sort of formally wrote down what, do the, what would the limiting system be. And there, of course, if you recognize Lasley Leon was sort of PDE people. So they wrote down some sort of um, PDE that would describe the value functions of these games, okay? And, um, you know, studied well posedness of these PDE problems, okay? And uh, then later, <clears throat> people like Carmona and Delarue, and then later Carmona and Delarue Racker, started proving convergence theorems of the sort that we saw in the static case, that the, really the um, equilibria of the main field game are converging to the limit system. And then we recently looked at refinements of sort of what is the rate of convergence, CLT, LDP. So we saw the large deviation principle in the, in the context of uh, static games. So today I'm going to describe sort of something about this convergence uh, for a class and some tell you what's known, what's not known, and maybe give you an idea of how the refinements can be done. So, okay. So just to a quick recap for those who said they didn't know stochastic, I think you just, okay, well, this is Brownian motion. It's just a random path whose increments are normally distributed with the variance T minus S and <clears throat> the increments are independent and stationary. Okay, so that's all you need to know about Brownian motion. Okay, and of course, if you have a d-dimensional Brownian motion, you're simply taking uh, each coordinate as independent Brownian motions. Okay, so now what is an N player stochastic differential game? Before we even talk about mean field or any structure, so what is um, an N player stochastic differential game? So you have some state process which is described by the following stochastic differential equation. For those who are not familiar with SDEs, you can simply just put this to be constant, I will most of the time. And so all you're looking at this is some integral of something that you understand plus a Brownian motion. Okay, so that's fine. And um, so here's, here's what we have, and you have some sort of drift, these are called the drift and dispersion coefficients, or if you're math financial, say volatility. And then you have these um, alphas, which are the controls. Right, that are coming in. That's so. This uh, you, you, your drift depends on the state of everybody else. So the coefficients, as well as the controls and the controls themselves. So I am looking now today. I'm going to focus only on what are called Markovian or closed loop Markovian controls. So you could also just look at general functions alpha t that depend on the entire past or just measurable somehow. And I will tell you that that's also looked at in the in the mean field setting but it's well, less well understood, especially in terms of refinements. So let's look at the Markovian control. So that means the control that you have, again, can only look, okay, at the current time, and it can look at the state of the process and decide what to do, okay? So it's not some general uh, function of the past or, or of the just adapted process measure, okay? And um, so, yeah, so this is all, can make it very general, but does, you can pretend it's all on the state-state space. This is just to say this is incomplete generality. 
k n equals so as i just mentioned i'm only allowing alpha is the closed move is only allowed to depend on the state and the current state and the current time it's not allowed to depend on the past the history of the x or just be general adapted i'm just saying that my control has exactly this form it's a function of the state and time not just some adapted process which is an open loop control okay um and now of course just some technicalities i can look at some subset of all this possible sets of controls for which this sde actually makes sense okay this is not too important okay for, for the moment okay and such as it has a unique strong solution and things like that okay okay so what is the idea you have this uh, differential game the stochastic i mean uh, this uh, dynamics for every control right if you choose it in that nice space of controls then this is a well defined dynamics that's well defined and what you're trying to say is that each player i seeks to maximize the objective functional which is this which is simply some integral of the past so looking at some function of the state as well as of the control which, which is all, since it's markovian of this form so closed loop and markovian are interchangeably uh, the same things and then something which is a terminal condition so this is just standard uh, standard cost functional in in control theory dynamic control theory okay so fi is often called the running cost gi is the terminal cost okay and i'm just going to assume they're continuous and bounded from above okay and so now remember in the static case we had a coupled system of optimization problems but now what we have is a coupled system of stochastic control problems because each i is trying to maximize this but then they're all of course interdependent right but of course if you know any, i mean control theory people if you have studied for a long time problems where you try to characterize what happens when uh, you if you didn't have any interdependence and you're just trying to optimize this individually you know you there's a, a way of sort of characterizing what the value will be for this person so but before that i wanted to say that in the static case we we said that if they're interdependent how do we sort of describe what is an equilibrium state that we want we did it through saying that the nash equilibrium this is just the same uh, analog here so what we will call a nash equilibrium will be again like we had a um, a profile strategy profile in the static case now we just have a collection of control i mean uh, n controls um, so that's actually n control functions right um, such that if you replace the ith by another uh, possible function closed loop function then you can only do worse right so it's exactly the same and i'm going to use a sort of similar notation alpha at minus i means everything else is the same and then i add beta on the ith position okay just to make the notation simple so this is ji of alpha prime this is a cap t is a fixed is a fixed type okay so it's some finite time horizon yeah i mean you could do this for ergodic things and other things but yeah yeah i mean this is just it's you're trying to say what would normally people want to it is like a payoff comma function but it's not really i mean this entire thing is the payoff function in a way remember we had a general ji and then we said we have jis of a particular form i haven't yet come to the symmetric form that's when i said they're all f here i'm allowing sort of general control so what i'm saying is what we're just looking at is uh where in a normal stochastic control problem this is a standard feature so you might say that i so let's say even a simple thing that it'll cost you let's say your goal is to get everybody to merge together okay or before we even do any sort of interaction you just say have one person and maybe the goal is to get to some target okay but your natural you know sort of proclivity is to move in this direction your drift so you have to actually move it in another direction but then it costs you something because you have to put some fuel to move it in that way so as you're moving along then this is sort of the cost for redirecting your drift and you can think of this as maybe you didn't reach the target so how far away are you from the target right so this is an example of costs which says that so you sort of balance how you want to get as close as possible to that but then you don't want to spend too much fuel on the way and so this is just an example of running costs and terminal costs but this is very standard in control and now we're saying they're all interacting each with their own objectives and but they also depend on what the other person does so then what happens 
Yes. Yes, but that's what we do, right? So you do a dynamic programming uh, principle. So I'm going to say what the hamilton jacobi equation is when you move. So your alpha, but the thing is your solution is an alpha of t of x, right? Which tells you what you should do at time t if you are at state x. Correct. So in some sense, that sort of solves for but, uh, all that, possible. But yes. That, would not yes, because it's a finite time horizon. It's not a stationary problem. It will depend on t, and so it'll depend on x. Is that a problem with the definition then? I mean, should I be worried about is that, that? That means that definition doesn't guarantee stability. Uh, stability of what? Um, so if if, you, if I start if, if the game was if the policies were a Nash equilibrium, and that everybody and I evolved. I mean, on a small instance? No, no, this whole, the Nash equilibrium is something that depends on the entire interval, 0 to t. Mm, the definition depends on the initial condition. Yes, but, but you fix an initial condition, and then you look at the entire 0 to t, and then I look at this entire functional that tells me at every time t, and if I'm at position x, what should I use? So remember your alpha is a function of time and space. Mm -hmm. And it's the, on that time interval. So every, at every time, I look at where I am in the space, and I do this action. So the Nash equilibrium is a complete solution to where I am in the state. And of course, it depends on where you are in the initial condition. Yes, but the, so that definition doesn't tell me that the Nash equilibrium will persist throughout, throughout the duration. Of so the I, what I'm not understanding is anything about persistence, because the Nash equilibrium is defined as something from 0 to t. It's not something that is, a, it's, a, it's not an instantaneous thing. No, no, it's not an evolving Nash equilibrium. So is there a notion by which we... The Nash equilibrium is the entire control that I use for the entire time interval. Correct, but uh, I'm not perfectly fine with that definition. Mm -hmm. I would just, you know, I, it, would, it would make more sense to me if that definition had, um, uh, you know, if, if x and t were explicitly written as a function of j, so J on yeah, I mean, often you know, your value function will have the initial condition and as well in that, it. And when you write that inequality, that inequality will hold for every x and t. Then I would be okay. For whichever so x. So if you go back to the slide, if you write this J one. i alpha comma x comma t, and you have for J i alpha. No, I mean, I mean, let's say x. you're starting. This is forget about. This is nothing to do with games. This is just stochastic control, yes. right? You just start, I'm starting at a particular initial state, and I have a control problem, and I am fixing the initial state, I'm fixing the cap t time, and I'm saying I want to solve this control problem, which is I want to see how I can get from here to here, given this is my cost. That's all it is. Then I say, I'm saying which is the best way to do it. Yes, but I, like, if, it, if the notion he is studied is the notion of Nash equilibrium in time. Uh, There's no, it's not a notion in time. You can. It is, I'm fixing a time, and it is a notion, it's a one shot. It's like I'm looking at, I'm going through, the, it's dynamic, of course, but the, it, like I'm looking at the entire problem as the optimization problem. My objective function is the integral over zero to cap t. Okay. It's I, not evolving with time. I understand the definition, I understand what it means. It's just why, maybe why don't you wait and see if there's, I'll wait, I'll wait yeah, because this is very classical yes, stochastic wait, control. Yes. So. Do people also have this? This is my question. Maybe we can try to understand this first. Yeah, it will come there. So that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's you're going to. It, the point is that in the end, because it's a Markovian control, it'll only depend on. So if it's stationary, then it won't depend on the time, right? But otherwise, you'll have the. It only depends on where you are on space. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, it's a classical optimal control problem. And the thing is, I can't be doing stochastic control here because I'm going to use stochastic control as given and say what is the new thing that comes up in the games, right? Because otherwise, I'll never get to the game part. Okay, so the solution to a closed loop control problem can often be defined in terms of, a, I mean, it's typically defined in terms of a Hamilton Jacobi Bellman, which is sort of a dynamic programming principle. And so for that, you define certain functions which are called Hamiltonians and this. Y and so X and alpha have the obvious interpretation of the state and the control. And the Y and Z are actually variables which will represent uh, this sort of a value function, which is actually what is your, like your JI, what you got, right? So, um, and it will play the role of sort of the derivatives 
of the value function, just to tell you what this. But anyway, this is classic. There is some function that you can define, okay? And you define that function, and then, uh, so you, you, you want to write down a system of equations that somehow involve these HIs. But now in classical control problem, you would just write down one AGB equation for the person who's trying to control. But now you have several of them interacting and they have some conditions. So there is also in addition to the usual AGB equation, there is something called an Isaacs condition that comes in, which is simply saying that all these value functions have to be linked in a certain way, which is just what we had, right? The GIs have to be linked in a certain way because you have to say that they are optimal if you change one. So this is exactly what happens to the corresponding Hamiltonian. So the generalized Isaacs condition is said to hold if you define your alphas in this way, in terms of x, y, z, and h is a function of all of these things, you define all of this in this way, uh, you have to, your h, i has to be the soup that if you replace the ith, you know, uh, control by an a, i, it's still the soup. Okay, so it just translates, it doesn't, the details are not important, it's just that the Nash equation, equation translates to a condition on how the Hamiltonians of these different control problems should relate. Is that clear? That's all you need to keep in mind if you're, okay. 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 So now I'm just writing down what the equation is, which is the, gen so suppose a generalized Isaacs condition holds and V is a C12 solution to this PDE system. Okay, so it's something I write explicitly in terms of HI I defined. You don't have to know anything, right? I just said I, I've given this problem, I've defined HIs, and these HIs satisfy this particular condition, and I have a VI that satisfies this, this equation. Then, uh, the, the, then if for this, and this, this, this is well-defined, suppose this, uh, this SDE is well-defined with this definition, okay? then the state, then the alpha star is in fact a closed, lap, closed loop Nash equilibrium. Okay? So this is a known fact. Okay, so this is something we start with for the N player. Okay. So there's a characterization of how, so we're, I'm just trying to say how do we solve for these optimal Nash things, and which is a function of time and X, which is where I am at any time. You solve it in this way, right? And so that's, that's why the initial condition is not really gonna matter because you start somewhere else, you're gonna solve the same PDE, and if you start it somewhere else, it's just your time will change. Yes, yes, exactly. And they're coupled through that other condition. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty ugly. Yeah, okay. And that's the idea. H i depends on other people's control. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what, that's what this whole thing was with this H i depends on everybody's. So that's why it's a vector here. Yeah, okay, so. Okay, so there's all this coupling that's going on. Um, and, but then what we know is, okay, there's this very complicated PDE if you solve in the end player system. That's the whole point, that just as in the static case, this is first to say that we said that even in the static case, where it's just optimization problem, we said Nash equilibria are hard to compute. So here you have a PDE, this not very nice PDE, and you have to solve it in order to know what's going on. So that's exactly the point that we want to get, can we do something else to take some limits to understand what the structure of this thing could be? Okay. Yes, sure. If you allowed history dependence, possible that there may be other Nash equilibria which are not Markovian and that would depend on you. Yes, yes, that is there. And I, I'm, not ta I'm not talking about open loop at the moment because that's even more complicated in terms of the mean field game. I will comment about it at the end. Yeah, so this whole... Uh, so yeah, in the game in the game context, there's a whole theory over there that that comes in. Yeah, yeah. Everything is harder in the in the interacting system in the interacting case. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So just let's start with a very simple example. I thought because you know all of this is abstract. It looks like you can never solve this. So I thought here let me let's look at the simplest case. So you have a, so that you sort of get an illustration of what is happening, right? So you have your uh, 
some, you have some control here now that's just good. So alpha ti, which is only depending on the state. So I'm not depending explicitly on the state over here. It's only depending on the control, which of course depends on the state. And then dwti. And or this is the form, explicit form of this objective function, which if you think about what it's trying to do, it's really trying to reward flocking behavior. So it's trying to make people come towards their average. Okay, so, so this is a concrete example of a running cost, a terminal cost, and everything that seems to be achieving an objective, right? Okay, so again. And uh, so anyway, so these processes evolve like this. So you can actually do this as an exercise, and you can see that, you know, this Nash PD system in this reduces to this somewhat simpler form. And with this boundary condition, where this is always that my bars will always be averages, okay? And then you can actually explicitly calculate each of the value functions. So you can actually solve the PD in this case. You have this explicit form. You, then you can write down what the alpha i star is. It's just the, well, there should be an equal, equal here. There's just the, you know, x i the derivative of this. You solve it. And then you have an explicit state SD. Okay, so, you know, this is not completely useless always. You can do it in this particular, of course, linear case. Okay, but a general, so now what do we have? We have this system, right, that that's what we've got. We're saying that when we, then they're actually, they're still interacting system, but they're interacting, now only interacting. There's the control has been taken away because I've already told you what the optimal control is and what the dynamics is. Okay. So now what you have is we want to now, if you want to understand asymptotics of this, okay, here we have it, you may still want to understand what happens in the large end limit in general, right? So now we're asking a question about I have I n interacting uh, SDEs and what happens. So now let's go back to remember that, you know, we're not dealing with games, but if they were just interacting SDEs, what do we know about limit theorems for such things? So now we're going back to this, more, this other framework where you just have um, a bunch of SDEs with some initial condition, excuse us, where uh, the drift is of the form, it depends on the state, and then it depends only on the empirical measure. Of the, it depends on the other particles only through their empirical measure. Okay, so now there's no control, right? So in general, if you wanted a general uh, SDE, it would just be B of XT, which would be all of the others. But I'm saying the way in which the drift of the ith person depends on all the others is of the specific mean field form, just like we saw in the static case, where it depends on its own state, but depends on the others only through the empirical measure. Pardon? Ah, we can also allow time, just for notational simplicity. There's no problem. Yeah, you get, you get time, exactly, I agree. Yeah, you can put T, it's just that everything was becoming longer. Nothing, nothing, everything holds true. But you're right that... To apply it, you need the time, and indeed, you can have the time. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, so you can just put T here everywhere you want. Okay. So it turns out that under suitable regularity conditions in the B and sigma, just some Lipschitz continuity with respect to the first state and with respect to the probability measure, some Vasa's time too, you can get convergence, okay? Um, of, of course, here I'm just taking these IIDs, so this convergence is obvious. So now what do you have? You, this converges to something, of course, that looks almost exactly like this, but the mu t n is just converging to something which is mu t. But if you think that in this system, the, the intuition is that in this system, again, each one is influencing the other only of order one over n, so it's decoupling, just as we saw in the static case. So if it's decoupling, you sort of have a strong law of large number type result over here, which means that you expect this to converge. If it converges to something, it will converge to the law of the x, the limit of the xt. And that's exactly what you get over here. Okay? So now you have this sort of system where dyt is being driven by its own law, which is why it's called a nonlinear Markov process. Is the intuition, so these are just regular mean field systems or called McKean Vlasov equations and or nonlinear Markov processes because if you write the forward Kolmogorov equation for this, it'll be nonlinear because of the presence of the law here. Right, so the equation that mu t normally would satisfy if this were a Markov process is linear, right, because it's a forward called Mogorov, but because it actually, the drift depends on the law, it will become nonlinear, so it's called a nonlinear Markov process. But this is still a Markov process, 
It's just a time homogeneous, you can think of it as a time and homogeneous Markov process of a particular kind. Because suppose somebody, the mu t is deterministic. So somebody, if suppose, you know, some canonically gave you the mu t from somewhere, then this would just, could be just written as a function of t and yt, right? So it's just a, but it's a non it's an inhomogeneous Markov process of a particular kind, where the dependence on t is actually through the law of it, right? So it has a better structure than just some arbitrary inhomogeneous Markov process. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah, I just said that the B and sigma, the conditions under the same conditions. In that case, this will have a solution. Yeah, this has a solution. There is like a general theory of when this holds, etc. No, you just need some nice Wasserstein uh, continuity type thing. Okay. Okay, so this is well defined and you have a nice solution. So if we go back, and again, you can have this with T over here. There's no problem. Thank you. And then with, if you have it with the T, uh, then, you know, it will start looking somewhat like this. But let's go to this now. So here, remember, we had this. Okay. So we had this drift. But even this, even if I allowed the T, it's still not of the same form because I have these ends here. So if I go back, what that corresponds to is something where it's a BN. It's not BN, T, X, T, N, I, mu, T, N. Right? So then I have to know how BN is changing with N. I can't just apply this McKean lesson. Okay, but in this particular case, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen, right? With if I take N to infinity. So obviously I'll just replace this and put the N to infinity and then just ignore the one over Ns. And so I will see that this is close to now this will be a classical IPS, the inhomogeneous version. Yeah, yeah I'm just assume everything is a strong solution here if you want for now. Except this will be, of course. I mean, this is only defined, I mean, it will be only unique in law. I mean, this will be only unique in law. Really, you only care about the mu t. So really asking for a strong solution for this is not very meaningful. You're really looking, because this is itself driven by its law, right? So what you really want to look at over here is just if mu t, this measure flow is unique. I'm saying here, just assume all of this is strong solution to make this. Okay. Okay. Is this clear? So now here I have this explicit example and I just simply replace it because by viewing I can do this. Okay, fine. And then the mckeen vlasov theory or whatever you want to call it implies that this x tilde ni converges and we pretty much can see that this will be the same for the xni, converges to the non, this nonlinear Markov process where the bar is just replaced by the law of the process. Okay, was that clear? Because this was the mean of the thing, so that will just be replaced by the expectation. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, so I, I purposely, by the way, I write WIs when I have the interacting particle systems, and when this is just some other Brownian motion that comes in, I just change it to a B. Okay, so that you can see when it's an interacting as opposed to just a typical particle driven by a one-dimensional Brownian motion. Okay, clear? Okay, fine. So now, um, and you can even do another, more things with it. Now, if you know this, you can actually, in this particular case, tr try to see, so this should be yt here. Um, you can write down uh, everything here. In fact, you can write down what they, not everything, but you can write down what expectation of yt is. It solves this ODE. It solves a particular ODE. You can, then you can solve the ODE, and it's explicit. So this should be y. But it's, y has the same distribution as x. So, you know, so it's a, okay. So the average, and you can also show that the average value functions also converge. You can write the value function explicitly, et cetera, of the limit thing. Okay. Okay, now let's go back to, so that was just a particular example where everything was solvable using the end player, and then, you know, you could look at what the limits were. But what happens in the other case? Even if you could solve the end player game, like nicely, that PDE, or at least you could say there exist solutions, then you could plug that in, and then you would get an end particle system, right? But then how, you can't just now eyeball it and say, how could I just change it to make it something which is a classical particle system? Now you'll have something where the drift coefficients depend on n for every n. So how do I then know, how, how can I couple, how do I know what its limit is? We don't. So is there a systematic way to figure that out? So now we will restrict ourselves. That was for all, I wasn't restricting earlier, but now we're going to restrict to n player stochastic differential games of that type, right, which is of mean field. Yes. 
So really, I told you what the condition was, is really that the VTNI has to have a C12 solution, okay, which is very, which is restrictive, which is restrictive, but I'm just telling you what the general principle is. And then, in fact, some of the um, results that I'm going to tell you, we have it under very strong conditions on the coefficients, okay, and then, but for instance, which did not include the linear control, but the linear control you can do explicitly and it solves the same thing. So let me tell you the general philosophy and then there's a question of how can you get the weakest conditions under which that kind of thing holds. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, so this is a symmetric N player, so now we're only going to look at such. So remember earlier we just said XT and, X, and alpha Ti, and now the dependence on XT is again through its own state and only on the empirical measure of all the others, okay. And again, even the cost and the G is now of that same form. And now I have all the FIs are just going to be F and G. Okay, so the going back to the homogeneous symmetric setting. Okay, just like we did in the static case. Okay, so this is what we want to understand and say, what do we do here? Okay, so I said again, in this case, let's say one can say that there's an, you know, you can write down this Isaac's condition, you can write down that equation, someone tells you, some PDE person tells you there's a C12 solution. Okay, and then you can, and in here you can see exactly what the alpha star should be, in fact. Okay, it's the argmin of this, and then you can write, this should be an argmin here. And we then define the equilibrium drift coefficient in this form. By the way, I'll have a B star, because I don't want to keep writing the alpha, because the alpha also depends on all these things. So I'm just going to write B star, which is going to depend on the state, the empirical measure, and then sort of the derivative of the value function. I will write it in this way. Okay. And then we will, like I said, this I'll off and, um, just assume this is constant to get rid of this. Okay. okay, so now we at least have all these alpha stars. We know what this, this solution is, but like I said, you will get a, a, an a n particle system where the coefficients will depend on n. So it's not clear how to replace this with an IPS with coefficients that do not depend on n. Okay, so maybe we will do, instead, we will try to show if there's a sort of limit analog of this game, which is what the mean field game is, which is what we did in the static case. Okay, so here's the idea, which hopefully will be not as bad given we knew what we did in the static case, which is now, again, remember, everything that's driving it is the empirical measure of all the other players, right? You don't, you don't know what that is because everybody depends on everybody else. But suppose someone told you that this is the empirical measure of everybody else, then you sort of decouple. Right? So then what you say is, suppose this deterministic measure flow were given to you, then you can solve the control problem faced by any typical agent, which would just be, you know, I just do my optimization of my objective function, and then I move along like this. Is that clear? If the mu t were given to me. Okay, but then, and then I could define alpha star to be the optimal control that you get from that right, from this, by solving this control problem. But then I need to ensure that the law of this entire process under this should be in fact this measure flow, right? So it's the same fixed point argument that we had before, it's just more, comp this, each step is a little more involved, but it's the same idea as in the static case. Okay, so this is the definition of a mean field equilibrium. So you say that mu is this, which is a measure flow, is a mean field equilibrium if it is a fixed point of this map. Okay, is that clear? Okay, 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 fine. So that's, and then you can define the mean field value function. Now here, you're starting with an x, and you're going, you're moving time t, and you fixed it, solve the MFG starting from t and some measure m. So this is now only on the empirical measure, right? There's no x. And then you denote the, all of these and you can define a value function conditioned on being starting at time t at x. Okay? Okay, fine. So we have all of this, but how is that going to help us? So ut in some sense is an analog of what? If you think, if I say that, so the whole idea of doing this limit thing was to say that it will approximate something in the end player. So just to see if I'm, you know, completely in the clouds or what would you, what, what n player quantity is likely to be close to you? Pardon? Uh, the average of what? So what? 
Right, but this is the value function. So there was the V, VI, right? The VI of each play, VINs should be like U, right? And now what we had was the optimal control was the derivative, partial derivative of the VIs, DX, IVI, okay? So, right? What you, what you want to do is you first look at this object as a function of mu, prove there is a unique solution of mm -hmm. this fixed point equation, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. plug that in, mm -hmm. and then and yeah, so that's, and take the gradient. Right, we might try to do something like that, right? So attempt one. Yeah. Suppose we know that the mean field equilibrium mu is the unique solution of this, you know, uh, mckeen vlasov type equation, right? Because if I am given the solution mu t, and, and then you recall where b star is this, alpha star is the derivative of this u, and then you now consider this n particle system in this way, right? Where before I would have had the dx of vx and i, I put dx u, okay? And that way now my coefficient doesn't depend on n anymore, right? So you, this is the natural one, and you say, okay, then this should be fine. So I, I, I just plug in this from the mean field sum. Okay. It turns out that this is not good enough, that this x hat is not close enough to the original process. Okay. But you have to do a slight modification. So remember, this was the original one, where you have dx ni with this dx i v ni, right? But now, instead of just using u, I have to use uh, instead of VNI, I will use a UNI, which will be a view of T of XI of MXN. That is, I actually use, so it's just a, it's maybe hard, it's a little bit of a technicality. Not, it's not technical, it's an important one. But the point is, I cannot use just the measure flow here. I have to use the particle system itself at the nth level. Otherwise, you're just going too far away. You, you know, you cannot just use the derivative of U, which was there for the limit, but you can use the function but you have to put the input measure as the actual empirical measure of the current system. Okay, so you have to do a suitable modification, and now you might say, can you show that the two things are, are, are close enough, that they're coupled close enough? Okay, so you look at this sequence of now IPSs, which are defined by this B tilde, which is now putting in this UXTM, okay? Okay, so just to, to, to remind you, we started with this Nash equilibrium dynamics, then we considered this associated weakly interacting particle system where this was this. Now can we show these two systems are sufficiently closed, the original one and then this one? Okay. If so, if now depending on what we can show about, so there's a lot known about general weakly interacting particle systems, assuming, of course, that DXU has the right properties, right, that, that you have. So you need enough regularity of U to be applying whatever results you know for uh, interacting particle systems. But at least you, there are large, uh, maybe I say that here, yeah. So the first thing we say is that, in fact, we can show that in, so these are measure flows. So remember, they are, prob they are stochastic processes taking values on the space of measures. So actually, paths of measures, okay. So anyway, you can put a Wasserstein uh, tube topology on the space of continuous functions taking values and probability measures, and then you can show that the, they're very close. Okay, so basically, they're very close. Okay. And um, how do you show that they're close? The thing is, how would you try to show that they're close? Because you want to show somehow U is close to VNI, in a sense, right? That's what you want to show. But we know that VNI satisfies a PDE. Okay, so remember what is U? U is a function of time, space, and a measure, right? A probability measure, M, okay, which is re representing the empirical measure. We want to show that, we know that V and I satisfy a PDE, so we might want to try to show that U also satisfies a PDE and somehow show that these PDEs are closed. So, indeed, that thing is called a master equation, and this was sort of derived by Cadiale de la Rue, Lazari and Lyon in 2016. Uh, but this master equation, in fact, uh, evol um, involves derivatives of u with respect to a probability measure. So if you think you have a functional of a probability measure and you want to define a derivative with respect to it, it's not trivial how you're going to decide how to derive it. We were fine in the static case because we could just, we said, oh, we'll just make it on the simplex and just say it's a Euclidean derivative. But here, it's not obvious, so maybe I thought this would be sort of of independent interest, even if you're not interested in the rest, sort of this 
notion of a derivative introduced by Laszlo Rion, and there are many different uh, interpretations of it as well, in terms of, a, you can think of, so the problem is, of course, is the probability measures are not a vector space, right? So you can't just have, the, you know, directional derivative notions easily defined. So really, um, this U uh, is, so this is a space of probability measures with finite second moments, um, is said to be C1 if, so we're, just the derivative is defined in this way, which if you look at this a little bit, so what does it mean? So this is firstly the derivative is a function of, you know, the point here and another thing. So you can think of this as sort of the direction along which you're der 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 derivating. So it's like more like a gradient to R, where this is like, you think of this as a gradient, this, is, this will be more intuitive to you. So I'm just looking at M tilde minus M. So if you think if you were on a, on a manifold, right, you have to say where you are and what is the tangent vector, right? So that's why this is a function of two things, firstly, because when we have derivatives, we just think of one point, right? But here we have this derivative is a function of two things. So you have to say where I am and which direction I'm derived. So if you think in terms of manifolds and not, you know, it'll make more sense. But anyway. But no, no, exactly. So I'm just telling you why it's at least to give you some, inter, uh, some idea of why you would have just two arguments as opposed to just one, right, for, for the derivative. So the and then, the yeah, but this is, here. Is a mixture, right? I mean, just with probability yeah. h, you sample them and tilde them, yeah. probability 1 minus h. Yeah, so it's fine. This is, this is hm plus 1 minus hm tilde, so this is always a probability measure. Whatever is coming here is always a probability measure. M times 1 minus h plus 1. Yeah, you can rewrite it as h plus 1. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so this is fine. There's not, no restrictions here. This is defined on the entire thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, for convenience and just because I want additional derivatives and things like that. Yeah. Okay. It has a nice structure. Well, it has a nice structure of, uh, you can use L2 structure to prove things. Yeah. So it's not completely convenience. Yeah. Okay. And then we actually, remember, we didn't have just one derivative of V, but we had two derivatives of V in the, you know, we had the nabla and the nabla squared. So anyway, this is a, it's a ninth interest you might, and what is the point of all these derivatives? So you define something called an intrinsic derivative, okay, which is, this was the derivative that we originally, du by dm, which is dm by u. So this is not the derivative, this is just, first I defined what del u by del m is, but the actual derivative that is of, will go in the master equation is this intrinsic derivative, which is defined in this way. Okay, so it's the derivative with respect to the second variable of this DUDM. So you can think sort of it's a derivative with respect to the tangent direction of what the gradient was in that direction. So, yes, U is a function of, uh, Y is just in RD, M is in P2RD. So the, this DU, DM Here, this will tell you why we're doing this. Uh -huh. So the U, the M is like the real representation of this mm -hmm. cross direction yes. derivative. Yes. So it's a function. Mm -hmm. Now that function has to be differentiable yes. with respect to Y. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so this thing over here is, um, is, if you think about this, why do we have this sort of strange, when we, we're always only actually in the pre-limit, only differentiating measures uh, which are like of these discrete, of this form, right, one over n. So, and you want these derivatives to look close to whatever is there in the limit, right? So if you try to just see what happens if you di differentiate dxi in this, you will exactly get something of the form that you want. Okay, so I don't have enough time. I can give you a lot more intuition as to about these derivatives, but I just thought at least I'll put it up there so you can get intrigued and read more about it. But I do want to tell you what the, the actual results were. Okay, but, okay. So anyway, you can write down this master equation, and we used uh, quite estimates on the master equations, compared it with the Nash PDE to get that result that we said. Okay, and then now that we've shown that the two things are close, we can use, I said, results for interacting diffusion to transfer it to games, right? Um, and so there are fluctuation results that are there before interacting, there were large deviations earlier, and then we had concentration. But the concentration, which is telling you for finite n how far you are away, um, there were only things when the drift was of gradient type for even just the regular interacting particle systems. So we actually went back and got results for um, just interacting particle systems uh, without the gradient restrictions. And um, so 
this is the result. So again, WPE is the Wasserstein distance on any space, Banach space. Um, okay, the usual one. So it's some notion of distance. <laughs> and then this is the relative entropy as usual. And so what we proved is, uh, so if we have two different with respect to the Wasserstein one and Wasserstein two, so Wasserstein one gives you a slightly weaker and Wasserstein two gives you more. Um, so if you assume something on the initial distribution that it has some exponential moments, then we can show concentration um, for the particle system, this particle system, just to regulate the particle system. And in particular, we can also show it on path space. So this is, this was just the actual X tildes, but we can also show it for the empirical measures, okay, at, at a fixed time. Okay, so just some concentration results, and we can get dimension independent concentration results if you do it in the Wasserstein II uh, topology, and we do that. So in the, in the interest of time, maybe I'll just tell you quickly the idea behind the proofs of those concentration results. So for the first result, we invoke a really nice result by Jelu Yan Wu, um, but, uh, but, and then we have to do a considerable more, we have to do a coupling construction and, and verify a certain transport inequality. Um, the, for the Wasserstein II result, we use coupling to prove another transportation inequality and use another result of Goslan along with that, with, which are just general results on sufficient conditions to get certain trans, uh, concentration inequalities. Okay. So um, anyway, so from that, we're able to get concentration for the n-player equilibrium dynamic. So we can tell you how far you are from the equilibrium for a finite end game. So here's an example. And again, with the measured flow as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so other refinements. So we can also use this basic coupling estimate that we had between the uh, U and VIN in some sense, right? Between the original particle system and the uh, we can use this basic coupling estimate to get other refined CLT results and large deviations, which we did. And it turns out we also, you know, in, in my entire uh, exposition, I always had only just one Brownian motion. There were all independent Brownian motions coming in. But in many applications, both just for interacting particle systems and also for the games, they often are driven by a common noise. So that in addition to this WI, you also have co a common noise that is affecting all these places. So if there's, there's stock prices or something, they're all subject to some other external financial noise or you know whatever, right? Or many system where they all have some common. So then the whole mean field equilibrium can be defined, but there's actually conditional laws that come up rather than just regular laws. You know, we have that yt is equal to the law of mu t. Now instead the measure flow you have, um, so, I mean, sorry, the other way, the law of yt is equal to mu t. So now you have to look at the conditional law of mu t given the realization of the Brownian motion. And so things are a little more complicated. And it turns out that the large deviations in the presence of common noise was not done even for the interacting particle system. So we sort of redid those and then transferred it to the... The unconditioned is done a long time back, Dawson and Gertner, this, you know. Ah, you mean quenched. Yeah, they're quenched. They're conditioned, they're not annealed, they're conditioned, they're quenched. Okay, so just to summarize, so under sufficient regularity conditions, which are quite strong, but in fact, the linear quadratic doesn't satisfy them. And another example called the Merton problem that we do is also doesn't satisfy them, but we show that the same approach can be applied there and it still works. So it could just be that we don't have, you know, the, the best PDE estimates in order to get the, you know, so you could relax the conditions of the coefficients to relax the coefficient, you know, the conditions on the coefficients of the SDEs. Um, but the same approach being that you take a symmetric end player game and you actually find the optimal controls somehow. You run the optimal controls and then you can change the particle system to one that doesn't depend on a coefficients uh, in, a, in a sensible way and then apply mckeen lasso processes to show that they couple. Okay, so it's not so surprising that this works for law of large numbers, but it's a little more surprising that this works for large deviations and concentration, yes. I think the philosophy can be applied in the differential equation setting because what, in, what you want to do is just say, instead you have a game, I solved the game, and the game should be close to the control problem. Now the only, you know, the, like if I resolve it, then I get an, a control, but now it's going, the control is going to depend on n, right? So what do I do to actually change that? It should, you have an actually version of it 
that you so can I define. Think, no, I mean, the, the philosophy applies in the deterministic. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, so then I can't say it now because. because I'm much broader than JP, which I have yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think you add a lot of weakness. So yes, of course. Explicit. You mean you mean the thing is, will you have enough regularity? Exactly. But uh, but like I said, there are cases where we don't have the regularity. Ah. I mean that we require for the general theorem, mm -hmm. but then we applied it for specific examples, and we showed that the same philosophy works. Okay. So all I'm saying is maybe if you're trying to get a general theorem and saying I just solved this AJB equation, but if you have a specific example or a class of examples, it could be that you could apply the approach by doing some particular estimates for that and get it. So it's not clear. I mean, you could always put some conditions, I'm guessing, and still get it. The question is, are those conditions good enough? Right? So, I mean, there's nothing in principle that will stop you. It's just the, the, the stochastic calculus and the the PDE will, of course, be some integral differential now, and so. Um, okay, but there's also a question. So I was going back to saying that the law of large numbers, maybe it's not so surprising that at that level that, you know, you sort of use the limit master equation to show that the law of large numbers converges. But you would think that there should be cases, I mean, in the sense that there should be cases when taking the limit functional that you get, right? The one that you get in the mean field equation and applying it to the, to the previous is not good enough. Like you will not couple with that system. It's not close enough. In which case can you still get systems which have a large deviation principle but go to something else? That is, it's not something that comes from being like a mccain Vlasov system but maybe some other correction. So that's a really nice, interesting open problem. I and mean, we put certain conditions which are fairly general but they're still restrictive. So can we find, and no one has found examples even in the continuous time Markov chain case, so can you actually find examples where you do have a large deviation principle, but it doesn't go to this mccain Vlasov one, but goes to something else, or even the CLT, right? So what we've really, the, maybe I should finish the general philosophy, is yeah, which is here, right? We always try to do, look at the MFG corresponding, and then somehow say that I get this uh, classical mccain Vlasov system, and then they go together. But there must be times when they don't couple fast enough, right? For large deviations, I need an exponentially fast coupling. So maybe they don't, but maybe this could still have a large deviation principle. If so, what could that be? And so that's like an interesting open question. What, what would that be? And one would like a nice example uh, to, to see that kind of thing. It's got two solutions. No, no. So the non-unique case is a completely different because then these PDEs are not even characterizing anything. So I'm saying even in the unique case, Okay, so there, then there are, um, yeah, so I don't know whether I talk about that. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm essentially done, but the, the non-unique case, let me come back to also what uh, Vivek Borka was saying, that if you look at the, um, right now we're still doing only closed loop, and then in the closed loop we're assuming that the MFE has a unique solution. And if you do non-unique, then you have to ask, even if you want large deviations, are you going to ask for the set convergence and use upper Vietoris or some other topology, or what are you going to do? Are you going to say the set of Nash equilibrium converges or, you know, so then there's a whole, even the end system likely doesn't have unique, so what, are, what is the question, right? So that's the one first thing. But, so the non-unique case is much harder and has not been understood in any system so far. Um, but the other thing that even in the feed forward, I mean the open loop, hasn't been understood um, because th there you can characterize these things in terms of forward, backward SDEs, and the estimates there don't seem to be good enough to get you what you want. Because you could ask, the, do try to do the same philosophy there, but it doesn't quite work. So maybe you just need to work harder and get better estimates for forward, backward SDEs. So it's not clear. So in the sense that the analog of the MFE in the master equation, you can also have a probabilistic approach and define it through a forward, backward um, a stochastic differential equation, and you have that even with the open loop setting, but then you need good estimates on that forward backward solutions to that forward backward SD, which are not currently available or yeah, haven't yet been figured out exactly what you need. So there's a lot to be understood in terms of refinement. So the law of large numbers has been really understood well in the last three, four years. Um, and it turns out that in the sense you can show that every Nash equilibria will converge to a limit, and but the definition of that limit is a relaxed version of the problem. So it's already, even at the law of large numbers level, more complicated, and you have to define weak solutions and 
allow some filtration changes and things like that. So it's it's much more. So that's nice work of uh, Dan Lacker than some of uh, Rene Carmona. That's what they're you. So yeah. So just to summarize, uh, there are many interesting questions, as I said, and uh, like I said, computation also. Even when the MFE is is um, unique, there are a lot of questions here, and you could look at more general payoff questions. And these are sort of some relevant publications. And uh, if you want to read more, like some of the things in this course, there's some nice pedagogical references. Cardiolage has some notes on mean field games and a more recent one, nice set of from a course of Dan Lackers in Columbia University. Okay, thank you.